go to him and in, isn't it? I'm excited to be here today, and I thank you all for joining us for the TEDx OCD Women event. It's an honor to be here. We're talking about resilience, and uh, I have a little bit of a personal upfront seat on watching a journey with that, as well as in my personal work uh, with domestic violence. So I hope to share a little bit about that, hopefully touch your heart, and maybe inspire you. And resilience is something that, to me, uh, it, it motivates other people, it's inspiring, and, and it is also a testament to the human spirit. And hopefully you'll see a little bit of that in the stories. So I'm going to talk first about my personal experience. Oops, there we go. Oh. Look at that good looking man up there. This is my son, Officer Chad Perry. And on February 15th, 2011, I received a phone call from my husband telling me that our son had been assaulted. And he was now, uh, had no feeling in his arms and legs and was on his way to the hospital. So for the next few hours at the hospital, OC at um, OU Trauma, we watched as he struggled just to breathe. <coughs> we heard the doctors tell us he would likely never have use of his arms or legs and probably never have any feeling below his collarbone again. We realized later that the doctor also tried very hard to tell us they did not expect him to live through the night. We just didn't hear that. Well, he did live. And after two weeks and two surgeries, he was transferred to a rehabilitation facility where the amazing therapists there and the doctors and nurses helped him to face a life over the next 110 days he was there to learn to face life as a quadriplegic, as he still continued with major medical issues. You know, the life as a quadriplegic is one that you're dependent on somebody for basically every movement and every bodily function. It was probably one of the most devastating points in my life at that time as a mother. How do you help your child face the total loss of life as they knew it and learn to face life one that most of us can never comprehend uh, what that is like. So in those early days in the hospital, one night he was laying there unable to move anything but his head and even that quite restricted with a neck brace. And he started crying and he said, Mama, I don't deserve this. And I'm trying so hard not to be better. And I said, no, baby, you don't deserve it. And through my own tears and heartache, I tried to tell him, you have every right to be bitter. But if you do, if you focus on that and hold on to it, and you focus on what you lost and, and the evil that took it from you, it will eat you up. And evil will have taken that much more. Little did I realize that those words would basically drive all of us over the next months ahead. Because in order to help him focus on the positive, we had to focus on the positive. And so we cheered every tiny thing. I can remember him, a thumb moving and saying, no, it didn't. Yes, it did. And he'd look at me, yeah, it did. You know, whatever tiny thing we could, however insignificant it seemed to others, we celebrated. So our journey began with that. We struggled through the next two years with really the, the motto that was um, our oldest son threw out initially and became Chad's motto and all of our mottos was defeat is not an option. He faced the next two years with that attitude. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna just lay down and not do anything. I'm gonna I'm gonna walk again. I'm gonna walk my daughter down the aisle. And he pushed and he pushed. And in doing so, he inspired many people. The, the note and the encouragement, the, the love that was we were in, really engulfed in from not only our family and friends and law enforcement, amazing family of law enforcement, but also from our community, from people around the nation and even from other countries. Chad's determination to overcome inspired others who wanted to pray for him and support him and that in turn inspired him to push even more. So just a brief glimpse, I'm gonna come back to that in a minute. Now I wanna to go to the work in domestic violence. Domestic violence is a crime 
that crosses all social economic boundaries. It's in all of our churches, in all of our homes, and not all of our homes, in all of our neighborhoods, and in our businesses. We just may not realize it. You may not be aware that most likely somebody close to you has had an experience with this. The lives around us are being impacted, whether we realize it or not. In all reality, one in four women will live a domestic violence life. One in four women. As you read this, I'm going to be sharing with you, I want to send, give you some of this information wrapped in a survivor's story. I'm going to call her Rachel. I don't know her name. This is anonymous. But this is a survivor's story. If you can only imagine yourself in Rachel's life, where every day, every, every minute at home, you never know if you're going to be beaten, you're going to be threatened with violence, and believing all the time that you deserve it. You know, domestic violence is not just physical. It is emotional, it's verbal, it's economic. It also is not just to adults. The children in these homes are also abused, at least 60 to 65 percent of the time. When you look at the societal issues across our community that we so often are dealing with, drug and alcohol, substance abuse um, of any kind, especially among teens, uh, teen pregnancy, school dropout, child abuse. There's an underlying systemic cause of domestic violence in all of these areas. You know, 60 to 65% of the children will be abused, but additionally, when there's a death from child abuse, there's a pattern of abuse against the mother at least 70% of the time. And when there's a death, when there's a murder in, a, in a domestic violence, one third of those murders are witnessed by a child. One third of the deaths, a child witnesses the death of a parent. Domestic violence is not a women's issue, it is a child abuse issue. As I said, it isn't just um, physical. The emotional is a huge impact as well. On a national level, the CDC, Center for Disease and Control, has estimated that, that approximately $5.8 billion, and we've done a lot of talking around the economy and our politics the last couple of years, $5.8 billion in additional medical, mental health services because of domestic violence. But that cost is impacting our country. We also look at uh, women who are victims who have been employed, that over 96% of them have talked about having poor performance at work because of lack of ability to, to focus or harassment at work or time off work. In addition to that, at least one half of them have identified losing a job because of the domestic violence. You know, the, the dollars that we're looking at on the econ economic level are probably uh, close to $2 billion on top of the other dollars we've already talked about. $2 billion because of lost productivity. That's every year, another $2 billion. On top of that, when we look at that, the numbers of what that equates to, we're talking about an approximate 32,000 jobs every year lost because of domestic violence. This is not just a women's issue. This is an economic issue. Allstate Foundation identified that there are at least three women killed every day. Every day because of domestic violence. Now that doesn't count the children who are also killed as collateral or the perpetrators who then in turn kill themselves. I'll show you this is what it means. This is impacting our communities. It is a dangerous crime. It is a crime that we've not really acknowledged a lot. We're just beginning to get there. But it is something that there are services out there to help. There are services to be able to help women and children and men, we do have some men, to overcome domestic violence. There are domestic violence service agencies like, like the one at the YWCA. And we provide trained staff who, whether it's counselors or advocates or someone that goes to court or sexual assault examiners, we train them specifically in the dynamics of domestic violence and sexual assault so that they can help the victims know how to get to safety and how to overcome what they have been through. You know, it took me a little bit when I started thinking about domestic violence and talking about resiliency, and it didn't take me but a few minutes to think, absolutely, that's what it takes 
for them to survive. There is a saying that says domestic violence will rise in a community to the level a community will accept it. We've accepted it for way too long. We've held our heads in the sand and said this is a women's issue. This is an economic issue, it's a child abuse issue. We are sticking our heads in the ground why the generations of victims and the generations that have, will come and the littlest victims now until we say no more not in our community. So I said we're barely acknowledging that it's a crime. We have made a few strikes there, but it isn't new. It is generations old. There are documented court cases as far back as the mid-1800s that talk about the man's right to has, has proprietary custody over his wife and his children and his right to beat them. Anybody familiar with that saying, uh, the rule of thumb? That refers to that law that a man can beat his wife. He can only beat her as long as the stick is no bigger than his thumb. And legally, she can't complain. And we have a long way to go in our courts in making this a rightful situation for victims. However, luckily, we don't still use that law. When we talk about the Domestic Violence Services Agency, we can see, I'm ahead of myself, so don't reach yet. One of the things that we know is, as we provide domestic violence emergency shelters for victims, when they know it's dangerous right now, I've got to get out this right minute. There is an expert, a violence prevention expert, nationally renowned, Gavin DeBecker, who said emergency shelters for domestic violence victims are the closest things that this country has to homicide prevention. Think about that. Now, Oklahoma did a 10-year study of domestic violence homicide <coughs> that actually supports that concept. Because those deaths that ended in a homicide, 98% of them never accessed victim safety services like a domestic violence shelter. They also, in that study, learned that in that 10-year period, domestic violence homicides represented 41% of all homicides in the state. Then, when you look at reports across the nation, there are reports from law enforcement agencies or states or people doing studies. The average is between 40 to 60 percent that domestic violence represents of all crime. I told our local chief, just think if we could cut out domestic violence, how much more money we have to spend on all the rest of the police needs that, are, that have to happen. Mm -hmm. In Oklahoma City alone, that one police department spent $8.5 million addressing <coughs> domestic violence calls and crimes. It is an economic issue, it's a community issue. I want, to, I want you to read this, these are Rachel's words. You said you'd destroy everything important to me, and you said you'd make me suffer every day for the rest of my life. You said you'd kill me time and time again. You didn't. I'm still here, I'm happy and stronger than ever. You pulled the hair out of my head, you sucker punched me in the eye, kicked me repeatedly in the stomach while I lay on the ground in a fetal position. You fractured my skull, and you told me you would shatter my skull. <coughs> you couldn't. I fought to survive. My will and my, I used my will and my strength to keep me alive. The light that burns within me is brighter than ever. You threatened to kill me and my family if I left. You stole my personal records to use against me. You cleared out my bank account so I couldn't escape you, but I did. It may have taken a long time, but I escaped you. I broke free from your grasp. I had everything to lose, and I jumped off, not knowing if I would fly or crash and burn. Turns out I can fly, higher than you'll ever know. You can't shatter my soul. It's too strong and weak. You tried everything in your power to destroy me, but you can't, and you never will. Can you hear the resiliency there? Mm -hmm. Amazing courage. Nobel Peace Prize winner Eli Weissel said, I swore never to be silent whenever human spirit, whoever human beings were being suffered and humiliated. We must take sides. Neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. Silence supports the tormentor, not the tormented.
So with that, I want to go back to Chad's story again. Would it surprise you to know that two of the three people that broke his neck were also domestic violence, had a domestic violence history? One of them had only been out of jail for three weeks. Well, Chad did go on after two amazing years, and he was recognized on national TV at a Thunder game. He amazed the audience who screamed and cried and cheered as he pulled himself out of the wheelchair to the walker. He took two steps and he raised his arm, which in itself was an amazing accomplishment in a victory salute. All the things he was told he was never do. Now, tragically, we did lose Chad uh, eight months ago in a car crash. Again, the next devastating thing for a mom is to lose their child. For worse devastating. <coughs> but, you know, I have to think as I go back that I look at the men that did this to me. And I think, had our community taken a stronger stand on domestic violence, would those men have been in jail still? and would our son still be with us whole and alive? <coughs> Domestic violence is an insidious crime in our community. I ask you to try to remember the words of Eli Weissel, to never be silent. We need the voices in this community to begin to stand up and say, not here, not in our state, not in our country. We need people to say, it's done, we're through, and begin to help victims find ways to be survivors. I would challenge you to learn where the services are. Here it would be our agency. But wherever you live and wherever everybody is listening, there are services in your area. And if you know about them and you understand the dynamics of domestic violence and that it exists, it is live and well, just like the evil that took Chad's life. <coughs> if you know that, you may be the one person that can help a victim become a survivor by helping them get to services. So I hope Chad's story and Rachel's story has touched your heart just a tiny bit today. And that hopefully in their stories you've seen a sense of resiliency and courage that most of us don't think about experiencing on a day to day. And I hope you will use your voice and take a stand. Maybe their stories will encourage you to say no to domestic violence and help us find an end. Thank you very much. <laughs>